Stories of skinwalkers, Bigfoot, and many other mythical beings seem to be a hot topic when it comes to scary stories. There seems to be tales to share no matter where in the United States you reside in. I live in northern Minnesota. Although we have some myths such as the Iceman, the Mystery Monster, and even Wendigos, I have always chalked these up to nothing more than stories. I mean, why would I believe otherwise? I didn't even believe in ghosts. I thought it was all just a bunch of mumbo jumbo made up to keep people on their toes. Perhaps just ancient tales to keep people from trespassing or making bad decisions such as camping alone. I've always lived a rather careful and isolated lifestyle anyway. So what stock did I really have to put into any of these tales? The story that I'm about to tell you is going to sound crazy. I'm going to try and explain it to the best of my recollection, even though adrenaline leaves more minor details in a bit of a haze. You see, I'm having a hard time digesting that something like what I encountered exists because this leaves all other possibilities on the table. Skinwalkers, Bigfoot, everything. They may be real as well, and that thought terrifies me. As I said, I live a very isolated life. This means I don't even know my own back roads very well, if at all. So, where the main road was closed whilst I went to pick up my brother from the bar in the city 20 miles away. I silently chewed myself out for not bringing a GPS. I do, however, have a general sense of direction and figured if I headed south and went back a little to the west, roughly 20 miles in, I could figure it out. I won't bore you with directions. The important part is, as I mentioned, I would have to take foreign back roads. Let me start from the beginning of the night and tell you some more about myself to add some more context. I was a 19 year old shut in. I spent most of my nights playing video games and feeding my caffeine cravings. I did have a part time job working at a farm a few miles down the road. The pay wasn't great, but it did pay for new games when I wanted one and other miscellaneous things. I was in that in-between spot in life where I knew I was an adult, but trying to find out what I wanted to do with my life was a daunting mystery. My skill sets were and are far and few between, and living in the middle of nowhere, opportunities were at a minimum. One late June night, I was playing video games as I normally do. I think the game was Destiny though it doesn't matter. It was roughly 12.30 a.m. when I got a text from my brother asking me to come pick him up from the bar. Keep in mind, bar closes at 1 a.m. He informed me he had no other ride and I was his only option. It was just like him to pin something like this on me at the last minute. I wanted to chew him out for going out drinking all the time, but... I felt it wouldn't help the situation currently at hand. Instead, I told him I'd be there, ASAP, and not to venture off. He has ventured off in the past, leaving me to look for him on the streets, since he's awful at replying to texts. I slammed the rest of my can of Mountain Dew, grabbed the keys to my 2002 Corolla, and headed out right away. About a mile in, is where I made the realization that the main road was closed. So I took a second to think, threw on my blinker, and took the gravel road closest to it. If memory served me right, I thought I remembered this being a straight shot with maybe one turn at the end. Not a big deal, right? Of course not. If I made it in time, it really doesn't matter what route I take. A couple miles into the road, I was starting to really like the scene of my environment. The area I live in is fairly forested, but the trees here just seem denser somehow. 
The road was as dark as it could possibly get, and it made me feel like I was in a horror movie. Which brings me to where things started getting strange. About ten miles down the road, I started swearing. The shadows weren't coordinating with my headlights properly. It's tough to explain, but it's like they were going outwards up top and inwards on the ground and in front. Now, I'm no expert when it comes to how Shadow should react, but it was one of those gut feelings that something about this wasn't right. Before I knew it, I came to the end of the road. There was a T-section, and I promptly took a right. One mile down that road, and it brought me directly into the city. Simple enough. I had a moment of self-celebration as I was proud of myself for figuring it out first try. I knew the city fairly well. Well, I say city, but it really only has a population of 15,000 people. Around here, though, that is a city. I got to the bar and found my brother, just coming out with a few of his buddies. Perfect timing as well. I pulled in, hitting the curb as I did, so making it sound like my car was going to fall into pieces. It grabbed the attention of my brother and his friends, and they all started laughing as my brother waved them goodbye and made a light jog to my car. He hopped in, and I backed out, and we were back on our way to the secluded road. We made some conversation as I drove with my window halfway down, as to not get a contact drunk. Believe me, I've seen my brother drunk. Many times. But him going out all tonight was quite apparent. It wasn't long before I came across the T-section again and took a left. My brother made a joke about me having to not take the main road, and how this is probably the first time I've seen a new road in years. I would have made a joke back, but I knew he was right. A couple miles in, I started noticing the shadows again. Brushing it off as nothing was my plan. But then my brother spoke up. Does something seem off to you? He asked. I was a bit taken aback, wondering if he was noticing the same thing I was. I responded with, what do you mean? He sat up a bit, surveying the shadows above us as he leaned forward. Maybe I've had too much to drink. At this point, my curiosity was piqued. No, come on. What's on your mind, bro? I don't know. These shadows just seem off to me. My suspicion was correct. It couldn't be a coincidence that we both noticed the same thing. He started shuffling around, looking more and more uneasy. We should turn around, he said. This was an odd request. I mean, I'm sure there are many other routes we could take. At this point, though, we were about five miles into the stretch. It seemed like a waste of time to do so. Odd shadows can't hurt us, right? He started to open his mouth again when his eyes widened and he yelled, Stop! I didn't hesitate. I hit the brakes as hard as I could without losing control. What, what happened? I asked. There's something in front of us. I looked ahead and couldn't see anything past the gravel cloud. We sat and waited for it to clear, my heart beating faster and faster with each passing second. Just as it seemed as though it would totally dissipate, something happened that I will forever have nightmares about. A face, about two feet long, and a foot wide, slammed into the windshield with so much force it caused the windshield to start to crack. The face seemed to be made of shadows. As it jumped off the ground and formed before us, there was no hesitation between me seeing this and shoving the shift into reverse and punching the gas. As we were backing up at speeds too fast to truly control, the shadows started seeping in through the cracks. We were both panicking as my brother took off his shirt 
and began pushing it against the cracks. How he made this quick decision while being wasted still puzzles me, but maybe the adrenaline made him sober up fast. I started to slow down so I could, as safely as possible, turn around. I whipped the wheel to the left and threw the car in a 90 degree angle, kicking up more gravel clouds as I did so. I went to shove the shift into drive when I realized my car had stalled out. Turning the key over and over again, I was looking around for where this creature was. Then I saw it, through my open window, about ten feet away, inching closer and closer with a grin that told me it knew it had us trapped. I took my hand off the key to reach for my window scroll to close it. Say what you will about this cheap design, but if I hadn't had it in that moment, I may not be typing this out right now. The creature, noticing the window was going up, moved with much more haste, closing a split second before the creature got to it. This seemed to anger it. It began screaming in a high-pitched wail that deafened me for a few seconds. Whilst all this was happening, my brother had the mental capacity to keep trying to start the car. Noticing it was still in drive, I pushed it into park. He turned it one more time, and the car started. Putting it back into drive, I took off once again in the opposite direction. We drove at speeds way too fast as we heard the stomping of the beast trying to keep up. It wasn't long before we reached the T-section again, and I took a right turn going as fast as I felt I could control. Knowing we weren't out of the woods yet, I stayed on it until we reached the city once more. Finally, hopefully, in safe territory. We parked on Main Street to catch our breath. My brother apologized profusely for making me come get him. It wasn't his fault. How could either of us have known Something like this could happen. How could anybody? Luckily, there were many more routes to take back home, and he knew them all. We took the one with the least amount of trees, and made it home, safe and sound. It's been a couple years since then. My brother and I don't talk about it, but we always advise people to stay off that road any time it is mentioned. He's quit drinking. Actually, I don't think he's had a sip since that night. I'm still a shut-in, but I do now have my own apartment in the aforementioned city. I work a office job there, and though it's nothing special, it works for now. That night left many scars on me. Every time I see a shadow, I wonder if it has come back for me. I've come to the conclusion that as long as I stay off that road, I should be safe. There have been a few disappearances in that area over the last year, and I think it is directly linked. As for Wendigos, or other things of the like, I now believe they could be out there. I still don't know what that creature was. A demon? A super-powered shadow person? Perhaps something else? It's tough to say. All I know is it doesn't hurt to keep your guard up. Most importantly, it doesn't hurt to stay off less traveled roads. What bothers me more than anything is not knowing if the shadows in the corner of my room at night are just shadows, or perhaps something more malevolent, waiting for its opportunity to strike once again. I'm writing this because I'm not sure who to reach out to. The police would laugh me off, and justifiably so. I considered reaching out to other sites or forums, but was finally led here by a good friend. One of the few people I could trust my story with. So throwaway account, and a few hours later, here it is. Take it for what you will. If you don't believe me, cool. Hopefully I gave you some entertainment in reading this, but if you are one of the few who choose to believe though, thank you. Truly. 
I don't know what my next step should be, and hopefully this post can spread and shine some light on the strange events that have been following me for the last three weeks. If anyone has any advice or knows what I'm up against, please don't hesitate to reach out. It all began almost a month ago when I was approached with this idea, for some backstory, but not too much for privacy concerns. I'm a photographer for a pretty well-known magazine. My job consists of mostly traveling to beautiful destinations, seeking out all there is to see, and snapping photos. Now, of course, there's more to it than that, and I take great pride in my work, but that's the gist of it. It truly is my dream job. Well, was my dream job. After all this, I don't know if I can continue. The subject of my latest adventure is in the U.S. Pacific Northwest. Specifically, the wild, wild wilderness it contains. My first stop, the Northern Cascades. Here I would be backpacking 20 miles into the national park with stops along the way. Loaded up with enough gear and food for four days, out in the wilderness, I began my trek. Now, I should say that my employer, well, they're not the most lucrative company in terms of how they treat their photographers. They pay well, but not that well. And hiring me an assistant? out of the question. But the job does have its perks, including access to many places off-limits to the general public, including the areas I would be visiting along my journey. Luckily, I've been doing this for a few years now, and hiking 20 miles in 60 degree weather is paradise compared to some of the things I've had to withstand in my career. Around 10 p.m. on the first day, I pitched my tent and hunkered down. Went over some photos of marmots, deer, and a fox that I had captured. Then put out the lantern and got some rest. I woke around 2 a.m. to a loud banging noise off in the distance. Not unusual, but still unsettling. The thing about camping alone, so far from anything, is there's no one to talk to. No one to bounce ideas off of. No one to rationalize with and no one to calm you down when you can't keep it together. The noise subsided, though, and so did my lucidity. My eyes fell heavy, and I collapsed back into sleep. The next day went just as well, and I reached my destination, catching some beautiful vistas along the way. After capturing everything I had set out to do, I made camp and relaxed for the night. Again, I awoke to loud banging, louder banging. This was definitely closer, and also accompanied by something new, and incredibly unnerving. A noise that is so hard to describe. I tried thinking of ways to describe it, but the closest I could come would be to liken it to something like an owl's hoot, but much longer, and with the pitch lowered way down. Something like a bullfrog's croak, but even lower, much louder, and with that little weird coo that owls have. I've talked to several park rangers since then, and even played a recording that I caught on my phone. But no one has been able to identify it. If anyone has any idea, please let me know. It echoes in my mind even as I write this. It's hard to describe how bone-chilling it is, and I have no idea why. And to hear it, when you're so far out, alone, with no cell service, or any way of signaling for help, I can't even describe the feeling. Despite the enormous dread, the sound again went away after just a few moments. This time, though, getting back to sleep wasn't as easy. After an hour of laying in total silence, clenching my bear spray, I finally fell back asleep. But you want to know what the worst part was? Knowing the next morning that I still had two days left out here. Except that wasn't going to work for me. I packed up as fast as I could and 
began hiking back at a brisk pace. I worked out that if I walked it faster, with fewer breaks, I could make it back in a little over a day, meaning I would only need to stay one more day in this place, and that by then, I would be much closer to the busier trails, and therefore safer. I walked 12 hours straight, with only two slight breaks, and managed to make it even further than I expected. At this pace, I could reach the truck by 1 a.m., if I walked straight through, and though I was exhausted as hell, that's exactly what I did. Everything went pretty well, until about 10.45 p.m., only a few minutes after total darkness had fallen over the forest, when again I began hearing the noise. The sounds had an otherworldly quality of them, like a cat's purr if you reversed it lowered the pitch, and filtered it through a megaphone. My legs were burning, but it didn't matter. I walked even faster. No matter how fast or slow I walked, though, the noise always sounded the same distance away. It never got closer to me, but it was always close, seemingly just out of eyesight. After over an hour of this nightmare, I caught a glimmer of the brown trailhead sign, and beyond that, the reflection of my jeep's headlights. I ran, threw my supplies in the back tailgate, and hightailed it out of there. But this is where things get even weirder. As I was pulling away, in my rearview mirror I caught a small glimpse of what was causing the noises. At the time, I didn't know what I was seeing. Something tall, very tall, with a darkness around it that seemed to repel the ambient red glow from my taillights. Around it, a long, tattered robe, seemingly crimson in color. Though, this could have been due to my tail light's glow. Either way, the image was visually striking and physically jarring. As the dust trail left by my jeep grew in size, the figure slowly faded back into the surrounding forest. Now, if this all sounds crazy, well, you're right it is. I have been to some incredible places, and some very frightening places, but I have never seen or felt anything like this before. But it doesn't end there, unfortunately. Two days later, the next wing of my trip took me to Mount Rainier National Park. Now, I was a little nervous still, but now I was 200 miles away. Whatever it was was surely gone now. If you've never been, the sheer vastness and beauty of MRNP is breathtaking. So after half a day of taking in the sights, the uneasiness faded away. Even the first night went by without issue. A little hesitant at first, I quickly felt relaxed enough to drift to sleep, staring up at the stars through the observation window in my tent. Waking the next morning, I found nothing out of place and nothing suspicious, confirming that whatever it was truly was far away. Another two days of hiking went by without any issues or disturbances, aside from a few cougar sightings and a pack of wolves in the distance on my second night. It wasn't until my last night that I experienced it again. Sleeping on my last night, less than three miles from my jeep, the same noises woke me in the middle of the night. Except this time it was very, very close. I shot up, grabbed my light and shined it outside of the tent. Immediately the light caught a glimpse of what I could now confirm was an old tattered crimson red robe gliding behind a giant evergreen. I became frozen in fear. My still waking mind could not even comprehend what I was seeing or what was happening. The demonic purring noises seemingly teased me from behind the tree. Now fully lucid, I began to contemplate my options. Option 1. Make a run for it, leaving all my gear behind, the least likely. 
Not only would I be leaving literally tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment, but I would have no chance of sprinting the three miles needed to reach the jeep. Besides that, whatever this was had to be fast to reach me so quickly, and also incredible at tracking. So, option one was a no-go. Option two, spray this thing with the bear spray and then run for it. Only slightly better than option one, but still not viable. And option three, the least fun, but probably most logical option. Remain in the tent until morning and defend myself if I have to. And so I did. I'm not sure what time I woke up. I was too nervous to even look at my phone. But I do know it was hours before sunlight. About 30 minutes after the first rays reached my tent, the noises finally went away. It was another 45 before I felt safe enough to pack up and begin the hike back. I reached my jeep and again broke every law in the park on my way out, leaving tire tracks and the freshly paved road out. I rented a hotel and regrouped, talking to a few friends of mine who were frequent hikers in the area. None of them had ever experienced anything like this, and only one actually believed everything I was saying. I decided to skip my next two stops, Olympics National Park and the Ho Rainforest. Employer be damned, it doesn't take a genius to realize that this would be a bad idea. So I decided to just go straight for my last stop, a much safer option, Canyon Beach, Oregon. Here I would just be taking some photos of the legendary Haystack Rock at different times of day. Sunrise, sunset, and some astrophotography shots with the rock as my subject. Even better, I would be staying in a seaside room with a view of the rock, so I could take shots from my balcony without even going outside. Again, the first day went by with no issues. Photos came out great, and it was time to get my rig set up for some time-lapse photos of the rock against the night sky. Seeing as I was on the third floor and everything was automated, I decided to let the rig do its work and get some rest. Because of the skip stops, I would have extra days here in case they didn't come out perfect the first time. I woke the next morning to find my entire setup on the ground outside the balcony. The whole thing weighed close to 50 pounds. So even though the gusts near the shore got pretty strong, I was doubtful that this was the cause. Luckily, nothing was damaged, so I wasn't too concerned. Until I checked the SD card. The first two hours of the time lapse went great, but then something odd started to emerge in the photos. In the corner of each frame, a red tint began to slowly encompass the image, until the photos were nothing but crimson red cloth. That was last night, and I'm afraid things aren't getting better. I'm packing the jeep and planning on leaving for the airport immediately, but something strange happened again. Today, in broad daylight, as I was catching one last look at the beach and all the tourists taking photos, atop the rock, I saw a tall, dark figure in a long, tattered, crimson robe. Update. I caught a flight back to Florida late last night and have just been resting and trying to get back to some normalcy since. Reading comments and suggestions helps, and hopefully, nothing sinister was truly at work at all. It's also possible that I had begun to go stir crazy, and I have made an appointment for Monday with my doctor to get checked over. So far, nothing too weird has happened. But I can't shake the weird feeling that I'm still being followed. Odd uh, noises and shadows playing tricks with me. Monday can't come soon enough. I have a friend coming over to stay tomorrow night. Hopefully some beer and video games will put my mind at ease. If anything new comes up, 
I'll be sure to update everyone. Update 2. I don't know what is going on and I'm scared. My friend never showed up last night. I've spent all morning calling him, texting him, along with calling friends and family to see where he is, and no one has any clue. I know it's only been one night, but I'm considering going to the cops. But would they even do anything so soon? He wouldn't go radio silent like this. This morning, though, I thought I heard a noise again. Could be my mind messing with me. I haven't slept good in days. Going to try and drive to the station. I'll update soon. Hey everyone, Dismal Hero here, and I'd like to thank you for checking out the video. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Like and share the video if you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching, and I look forward to seeing you back here again next time.